Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in the Gospel of John. We recently began a verse by verse study here in the Gospel of John. And so we come today to John chapter 2, and we left off in verse 5, so we'll pick it up right about there. Get your Bible if you can. Open it up to John, Gospel of John chapter 2. The Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. You can study the Bible in its entirety from Genesis through Revelation, verse by verse, using my audio Bible messages. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. Check it out. Study at your pace, at your convenience. All you need to bring is your Bible. The rest is there. Click and listen, just as we're going to do today. Studying together, verse by verse, the greatest book in the world, the greatest gift, the greatest thing that we own, that we have in this world is the word of Almighty God. Just think of it. God the Creator, God the Savior, His word to us. And Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's begin reading in chapter 2, verse 1. It says, And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they lacked wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Je Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatever he saith unto you, do it. And now verse 6. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Okay. The Jews of our Lord's Day, especially the religious leaders, went through all sorts of religious, ritualistic washings before they ate. Much of it was just Pharisaic nonsense, which had nothing to do with the Word of God. But these six pots contained water for those washings. That's what they were there for. They were water at this wedding for those purification, ritualistic washings. So there were six of them. And it says in verse 7, Jesus saith unto them, to the servants of, at the wedding, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. You know, I've said it many times, haven't I, that every single word of Scripture is absolutely essential. This is why I despise the NIV, the New Living Translations, and all other translations which are like that, which are so-called a free translation rather than a literal word-for-word -word translation. They tell you what the they tell you what the translator so called thinks. Rather than the translator translating the word of God, he's interpreting the word of God. I have no use for those versions at all because they leave out so much. They change the word of God. They play fast and loose with God's words. Bad enough that, that they're modern translations based on a modern Greek text, but then to add to that the insult to God of being a free translation, which is giving you what the interpreter thinks the Word of God means, rather than interpreting the Word of God, or rather than just translating the simple, God, simple words of God. And I've said that so many times. It's so important to leave God's Word alone because every word that God gave is sacred. And we're going to see that right here. Notice what it says in verse 7. They filled the pots with water 
to the brim. To the brim. God meant what he said. And this was extremely important. You might not think that that's an important thing. Maybe you think it's okay if, if the translator said something like, well, they just filled them up all the way. Something like that. It's not all right. To the brim. Why is that important? Because Jesus is going to change that water into wine. And no one will be able to say, well, he just diluted the wine that was left. Or he just, he yeah, he diluted the wine that was left. They were almost out, so they pilled, put water in the pots and it was diluted wine. Nobody will be able to say that. It was all water all the way to the top. He filled the pots with water to the brim. Verse 8. And he saith unto them, Draw some out now, and bear it unto the governor of the feast. And they bore it. The ruler of the feast, or the governor of the feast, was in charge of the food and the drink at the wedding. Somewhere between the time they filled the pots with water to the brim, and the ruler tasted that water, somewhere between the time that they filled the pots with water to the brim and the ruler tasted it, Jesus changed that water into wine. Verse 8, And he saith unto them, Draw some out now, and bear it unto the governor of the feast. And they bore it. The ruler of the feast, as I said, was in charge of the food and the drink. And notice what it says in verse 9. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not from where it was, but the servants who drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. So notice verse 10. And saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. And you know why that is? It's because your taste buds become dull. That first drink, whether it's coffee or anything, your taste buds are the sharpest. So it was customary in situations like this that the person in charge of the food and the wine would bring out the best wine first while people's taste buds were really sensitive and they could take a drink and say, well, that's fantastic wine. But then after a little while, you know, when, when that wine ran out or something, it started running low, they would replace it with cheap wine and the taste buds were already desensitized to a certain degree, so it didn't matter anymore. You, didn't, you couldn't tell the difference. Say, I had this happen to me one time. I stopped. I was thirsty. I was driving. I was really thirsty. And I stopped and I got, I'm not going to tell you the brand, not, brand name because I might get in trouble. But it's a brand name of soda. And it was vanilla flavored. It was also diet. Diet vanilla blank. Okay. And I took a drink of that and I was really thirsty. I took a drink of that, and uh, it was like horrible tasting cough medicine. It was the most putrid thing I've ever tasted. So I set it down, and I got to have another drink. It could it really be that bad? <coughs> so I took another drink, and you know the second drink that I had wasn't quite as bad as the first. It was still bad, but it wasn't as bad as the first. I had another drink. One quite as bad as the first two. My taste buds were becoming des desensitized, see? But then I waited. I thought, man, this stuff is still bad. So I didn't have another drink for probably about 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Took another drink after 15 or 20 minutes. It was just as bad as the very first drink. It was horrible. So when I stopped at the gas station, I threw it out. It was terrible. A person's taste buds 
are the most sensitive the first time they try to taste something. After that first taste, their, their, taste of, or their sense of taste is dulled somewhat. And that's why people serve the good wine first, and then later they bring out the cheap stuff. But Jesus' wine was so superior that even after their taste buds had become des desensitized, because they've been drinking wine all day, but even after their taste buds have been desensitized, the people could still tell that it was better wine. It was, this was the best. So that tells you about stuff that Jesus made. He doesn't make, he doesn't make cheap stuff. He makes good stuff. Nothing but the best. 11. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. And after this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. So this miracle, this very first miracle, revealed the glory and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus looked like a normal man. He was a normal man. He was 100% man. He was a normal man. But we, when he did a miracle, he proved that he was God as well as man. So his miracles displayed his glory. His miracles made a statement about his deity. 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. It was important, not only for Jesus, but for us, that he go to that Passover feast in Jerusalem. And here is why. Again, you might read that and think, well, that's nice. He went to Passover. It's a big deal. It is a big deal. It's extremely important that he went. Actually, if he doesn't go, then we all go to hell. He could go to the cross and be crucified, and we'd still go to hell if he doesn't go to this feast. You say, well, why? Is he dying on the cross there or something? Is, is that what he does or, or what? No, not this time. But it was required by God that every man attend the Passover each and every year. That was a requirement. To not do so would be sin. If Jesus doesn't go, he disobeys God, which means he's not sinless. And if he's not sinless, he can't be our sinless substitute and pay for our sins on the cross. And we go to hell. So everything Jesus did was extremely important. Just like everything he said was extremely. Every time he moved his lips, he spoke the word of God. Every time he did something, he did what the Father wanted him to do. All the time, big things, small things, everything was important, including this. That's why we should not, we must not dismiss anything that is written in Scripture. Every single letter is important. Every crossing of the T, every dotting of the I is absolutely essential. 14. Let's read 13 along with it. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. And he said unto them that sold doves, Take these things from here. Make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And the disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Using holy things like the temple, in Old Testament days or in our Lord's Day or church or the Old Testament sacrifices 
or the Old Testament religious rituals that were based on the Bible, using any of these things, using the Word of God, using the Bible, anything that is holy, anything that must be set apart for God, using any of these things, using the name Christian to make a buck is wrong. You say, well, I don't think it's that big of a deal. I like Christian rock groups. I like Christian entertainers. Yeah, well, Jesus doesn't. You use anything. You use a name Christian or Christ to make a buck. I will tell you what Jesus thinks of it. No, I will not. Let Jesus show you what he thinks of that. Because that's exactly what's going on here. The religious leaders were using holy things in the temple to make a buck. And Jesus went in there. And he cleaned house. And he was as angry as you will ever see him on earth. Take these things from here. Verse 16 says, Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And he drove them out. He overturned the tables, the money changers, drove out the animals. He was furious. He broke out a whip and he cleaned house. And that's what Jesus thinks of you or anybody else using the name Christian as an adjective to describe your entertainment or your singing or your band or your rock group or anything else for that matter. To make a buck. That's the issue. To make a buck. It's wrong. You sell tickets to draw, you sell tickets for something that you call Trish, Christian? I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's a preacher or a group, a singing group. I don't care what it is. It's wrong. It misrepresents Jesus. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. Nothing wrong with taking an offering if you're a minister. A music minister or a preaching minister, a Bible teacher, nothing wrong with taking an offering. But you better not sell tickets and call it Christian because that makes God angry. He was furious. Furious. And again, I'm not talking about receiving free will offerings. The Bible says those who are taught the word, for example, should give to those who teach. But schemes to make a lot of money, marketing techniques to make a lot of money, that's wrong. I'm talking about people who sell their ministry, who peddle the word of God, who sell their prayers. Or think of ministry as a career. Or like I said, charge X amount to go preach somewhere. Well, I'll come if you give me X amount of dollars. Then don't come. Just stay home. God doesn't want you. He doesn't. I'm telling you. He was furious here because that's exactly what they did. And I know, I know Christian music especially, but a lot of Christian so-called ministers too. That's big business today. And it's all wrong. Measure it by the Word of God. I might be shocking some of you who are hearing this for the first time. You have been lulled to sleep into thinking that all this stuff is perfectly fine. It is not. Many Christian so-called radio stations are more of a business. They're money-making outfits. First and foremost, they make money. That's why they cater to people. It doesn't matter really that much what their theology is. They accept anyone and everything, just about, to bring in money so that the station prospers 
you dirty snakes, you brood of vipers. Jesus hates it, and he ain't real thrilled with you either. And if you don't think that's true, you better read this chapter again and take note of what we just saw. He was furious, as angry as I've ever seen him. This is, this is making, Je this made Jesus angry because it is making merchandise of something that is holy, like the name Christian, or in this case, the temple. It is making merchandise of something that is supposed to be holy. Verse 17, again. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. You know, if you're going to, if you have a zeal for God, if you have a zeal for Jesus Christ, then things that dishonor God are going to anger you. You say, Marat, you shouldn't get so upset. You should be more even keeled. Oh, like Jesus? When he took that rope and he made a whip out of it, and he saw these people making merchandise of holy things, Christian so called things. And he knocked over the tables and he spilled the money changers all over the place. And he drove out the, the sheep and the oxen that they were selling at an at a, uh, exorbitant price to take advantage of the people. And he was furious. You better be angry at the things that God's angry at. You better have some passion in your life. You better have a zeal for the things that God has a zeal for. You better have a zeal, a hatred for those things that dishonor God because they sure got Jesus' blood boiling. And what's the matter with you? If you just think everything is just fine and you don't want to rock the boat, Jesus didn't mind rocking the boat. And if you're representing him, you shouldn't mind either. Verse 18, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that you doest these things? You know, if the rulers would have spent more time with God and less time with their religious marketing, then maybe, just maybe, they would not have asked Jesus for a sign. They would have recognized that Jesus' cleaning house was a sign. His zeal for the purity of God's house was, as it says in these verses, a fulfillment of prophecy. They would have recognized, if they would have spent more time with God, more time in the Word of God, and less time marketing their ministry, they wouldn't have been so stupid. They wouldn't have been so ignorant of truth. They wouldn't have asked for a sign because they would have known that that was a sign. Jesus was fulfilling prophecy. They would have recognized that what was going on in the temple was wrong and that Jesus was holy and righteous to put a stop to it. But right now they're bugged. They're really bothered because he interrupted their money-making scheme. 19. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou raise it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. Jesus says, You want a sign that I'm Christ? I give you a sign. You want a sign that I'm the Son of God and therefore have the right to to come into my father's house and drive all these charlatans out of this holy temple? You want a sign that I am qualified to do that? Drive all this blasphemous marketing out of the temple? You want a sign? Kill me. Just kill me. And in three days I will raise myself up. A dead man raising himself from the dead after three days is more than enough proof for any reasonable person to see that that man is God. Verse 22. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the words which Jesus had said. 
So after Jesus was raised, it clicked with the apostles. What, he, what they saw here, what they witnessed here, and what Jesus said evidently went right over their heads. But after he was raised, it clicked. Then he knew what he, Then they knew what he was talking about. That's what Jesus meant when he said, destroy this temple and I will raise it in three days. He meant the temple, his human body, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Kill it, destroy it, I'll raise it back in three days. Oh, now we know what he was saying. We get it now. Verse 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name. When they saw the miracles which he did, they believed. So it says. But for many of them, it was a shadow belief, very shallow, based entirely on his miracles. When the miracles stop and their flesh is no longer being tickled, then they will stop believing. A faith that is based on miracles is a shallow faith. A faith that is based on the immutable, immutable word of Almighty God is an unshakable faith. 24. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. See, this is what Jesus knew what was going on. Jesus knew that their faith was superficial. He knew that. And he didn't count on any of them because he knew they were not serious enough about him to be counted on. Yeah, they believed in Christ. says that they did. But to them, he was just another just another thing in their life. Just another thing, not the thing. And they, he was another thing because he tickled them with his miracles. Verse 25. Let's read 24 along with 25. And Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man for he knew what was in man. Jesus is God because only God knows what's going on inside of a person's soul like he does. He knew what was in man. He's, that's talking about in man's soul. Only God knows what's going on in your soul. A lot of times you don't even know what's going on in your soul because the Bible says that the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You, you, your soul will, will deceive you into thinking that you're good and you're justified in what you're doing even when God knows it's wrong. Only God, only Jesus knows what is inside a person's soul. A person's outward behavior can sometimes mask their true self to other people, but not to Christ. You're not getting away with it. Neither am I. Jesus knows if our hearts are set on earthly things or on eternal things. He knows our souls. They're an open book to him. Might as well be sincere because you're not fooling him. And he's the only one that matters, right? Out of time. Continue studying the Word of God with me using my audio Bible messages. And that's found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Check it out. Study from Genesis through Revelation at your pace, at your convenience. Just click on the book you want to study. Click on the chapter. Open your Bible. Listen. Follow along as I teach it verse by verse. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. Please remember, we're brought to you by your prayers and your financial support. If you want to be a part of this ministry, if you love the pure Word of God, and you know I don't water it down, you know I just give it out as straight as I possibly can, not adding anything to it, not taking anything away from it, just the Word of God. It is enough. It is enough. It is sufficient. That's what God teaches. And if you believe in what I'm doing, and you want to be a part of this ministry and help me to proclaim God's Word like this, then pray for me, would you? And pray for Scripture verse by verse. And also click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. I'd appreciate that very much. Until next time, this is Michael Moret for Scripture verse by verse. So long, everyone.